Okay. So I'd like to welcome Brian Aspinall to um, our OTS Connect session. And um, and Brian is a teacher, and he'll he'll actually do his sort of introduce himself and give you a little bit of background teaching. But he's presented for OTS Connect several times, and I can tell you that you're in for a real treat, and we'll learn an awful lot from from Brian about using coding and um, and other applications to introduce your students to some pretty amazing concepts. Um, it's great to see some teachers from all over Ontario participating in this webinar. And I'm going to turn it over to you now, Brian. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Brian Aspinall. I'm a grade 7 and 8 teacher with the Lambton Kent School Board in beautiful Chatham, Ontario. Um, I'm a little bit biased when it comes to coding and computer science. Uh, I studied computer science in my undergrad before I ended up in elementary school. So I've, uh, you know, for the last decade or so, I've tried to find a way to implement it into my lessons. And I'm super excited to see it getting some traction, um, you know, in the last three years with the hour of code and, and the things that are happening out east and out west in our country and, and things that are happening right here with uh, this tonight. Um, it looks like we're at almost 50 people, so that is Fantastic. I have a whole series of resources posted kind of all over the place on the internet that's, you know, my online presence is as unorganized as my brain and my teacher's desk at school. Uh, but if you do hit on that QR code, you should get sort of a central location um, where you can find some of the articles I've written and, and slides I've posted and YouTube videos I've recorded and lesson ideas and crazy blog post rants sometimes and, uh, you know, sometimes some good writing, I think. So, without further ado, I am just curious, uh, how many of us are at least elementary teachers? How many of us are secondary teachers? So, if we could just spend about 30 seconds in the chat box. I'm just curious what our demographic is here. I, I don't really want to focus this webinar on a group unless we're, you know, completely one-sided, which it looks like. Okay, mostly, mostly elementary. And one thing that Mally just posted in the chat that got buried pretty quickly, of course, um, there are QR codes on, on a few of my slides. I don't have very many slides tonight because I wanted to make this as live as possible. Uh, but if you do have a QR code scanner on your phone and you want to grab a link or you want to check out some of the resources I have posted at a later date, that's what they're there for. Because the slides are not clickable, um, I've included the QR code so that you can scan them in that regard. So I see that we are mostly elementary school and I see that we are mostly junior intermediate, which is absolutely fantastic. Uh, there are some good primary resources here, but I don't want to overwhelm our primary friends, too. Because I do teach intermediate, I tend to be sort of, you know, intermediate dominant, I think, with my work. So that's great. So what is coding? The coding craze has kind of blown up in the last three years due to the hour of code. Um, I think the hour of code has done a great job for computer science and, and STEM education. I think we... We need to realize that the Hour of Code is a fantastic entry point and is not a destination. Um, you know, in my own, my own world, I, I sort of get discouraged when I see people try the Hour of Code and, and stop there. You know, we print our certificates, so I'm really happy to see such a great turnout here because it, this is really, really important for our students. Uh, and their future. I mean, this, this coding thing and, and computational thinking and technology is changing at a rapid pace. And we know how long it takes to write curriculum documents. It's, it's going to be a challenge to keep up with, with the way things are going. So uh, the coding craze, what exactly is it? Well, it's a series of text. It's a series of block code. It's like a procedure in science. It would be like writing a set of instructions and telling the computer to actually do something. I like to use the, the old game Pac-Man as an example. So when Pac-Man was written in the 80s, uh, it used principles of geometry at its foundation. So when you moved a joystick to the left or right, the Pac-Man character would flip. 
if you moved the joystick from a left or a right position to an up position, Pac-Man would rotate, you know, and I, I really like to use that as um, introductory lessons to geometry, particularly in grades 7 and 8. But if you think about the behavior of the ghosts, the ghosts all behave differently in the Pac-Man game because the ghosts have all been uh, coded differently. Because if the ghosts all behaved in the same manner, the game wouldn't be very fun. And so each ghost, uh, each character in the game has its own set of code. And that's something we're going to explore today. So I want everyone to sort of realize that when you think about these games and stories and apps, we're not just coding sort of one, one entity. It's this, you know, th not three-dimensional, but this sort of cross-matrix, uh, spatial reasoning, big picture sort of thinking where we have to, you know, like, like playing chess and sort of predict three or four moves ahead and try and determine how characters are going to interact with each other and what different scenarios might be. So it really adds this form of, of critical thinking to some of our narrative stories. Uh, the term critical thinking in my world is changing. I call it computational thinking. Seymour Papert started the term computational thinking in the 80s, and it sort of gained some traction in the late 2000s when Jeanette Wing from Microsoft uh, spent a lot of research and a lot of time focusing on this term. So the idea of computational thinking is it's critical thinking combined with the power of the computer or the power of technology. So it's thinking critically and using the technology that's available to us to solve problems we couldn't solve before now that new technologies have been created. And I think computational thinking is the fundamental skill um, that we need our students to be thinking about. Um, and coding is a piece of that, but so is building something in Minecraft, so is organizing data in spreadsheets. So think of computational thinking as that, that big umbrella and anything you know, underneath that, that we can do now that we couldn't do before. It's, there's some overlap there with the SAMR model, I guess. It could be, maybe students are creating a green screen movie to raise awareness about something. I mean, that's thinking, that's computational thinking. So something that they're able to do now that they couldn't do before. So I always like to start my webinars with these slides because I just want to sort of raise the awareness as to why we're doing this. Uh, the Hour Code, like I said, is, is a fantastic movement. Um, but I'm not sure, you know, I'm not sure how many people realize why we are doing the Hour of Code. Why are we doing the things that we're doing? So computational thinking and, and coding at the end of the day, if you're not even doing anything but playing with code in the Scratch platform, you're doing geometry regardless of what grade you teach. So I hope that really pops today. That if you go back to school tomorrow and you say, we're just going to play on Scratch, you're at least doing geometry. And it's really cool to watch our young students understand some of the intermediate principles of geometry. So students in our building in grades four and five are, are playing on the Scratch platform. And I hear them talking about curriculum expectations that I'm expected to teach in grades seven and eight. So I wonder what that's going to look like in the next two or three years when they come to me, having the fundamental understanding that if they want to make a character move backwards, you have to put in a negative x value. And if you want to make a character you know, move up, you have to put in a positive y value. So really, really, really powerful things. Moving over to Scratch, uh, this is kind of a part two webinar from an introductory coding one we did about a month ago. And we thought we should focus on one tool in particular just to kind of get our feet wet. So tonight we're going to actually build an app in the Scratch platform. But what a lot of people don't realize about Scratch is it's over a decade old. It's been around for a long time. It was put out by MIT. Um, the folks over at Scratch, actually Scratch is based on Seymour Papert's logo from the 70s and 80s and sort of been revamped for the 21st century. Um, there are different versions of Scratch for different devices that I can talk about later, but we're going to use the web-based version of Scratch, which is currently written in Flash. Um, I would anticipate any day now that they're going to re-release it under another um, sort of platform because it's obviously problematic in some of our web browsers on some of our iOS devices. But if you could hit that link or scan that QR code, there's a video there. It's just over a minute long. I would love for you to watch the video. It's at the top right corner of the page. And maybe when you come back, um, hit, hit the green check mark like we did with the poll so that I know everybody has finished the video. I'll give you about two minutes. Um, I'll try and post that link into the chat box. And I'm going to mute my microphone, so don't think something has happened to your audio. It's just because I talk fast, and sometimes I need to take a giant breath. So 
I'm going to hit mute on my microphone right now, and I encourage you to go watch the video. Hit the green check mark when you're finished, and I will see you virtually in two minutes. I see we have a question, so go ahead using your microphone, or you can ask it into the chat box. Okay, moving forward. So Scratch was based on the principle of four P's, and I think that's important to mention. Um, I hear about the six C's, a tremendous amount in, in education today with uh, Michael Fulon's work out of Toronto, of course. Uh, the six C's actually exist in our school board's engagement model here in Lampton, Kent. Uh, but Scratch put out uh, the four P's over a decade ago, and that was peers, projects, passion and play with an emphasis on the collaborative piece and, and the play piece, like just getting in Scratch and just tinkering, you know. Um, we have all these makerspace learning commons sort of movements happening today and that's something Scratch I think has been pushing for for a little over a decade and I love seeing how Scratch actually works with a lot of our um, makerspace tools that we have today so I'd love to talk about that later on. Uh, so without further ado, getting started, if you want to scan that QR code um, and try a Scratch project, try and follow along with us. I've done this tutorial live a few times, so I, I know that I can be fast, and please hammer on that hand or a red X or something to let me know that you're getting behind. I do want to make this as interactive as possible. Um, underneath that sort of collaborative inquiry model where we can kind of teach each other and sort of stumble through this. I don't really have a script, I'm just sort of doing it from memory, but head over to scratch.mit.edu and I'm going to share my screen right now. And hopefully you can see it, it's just popping up on my iPad, there we go, scratch.mit.edu. Now word of warning, whatever we create tonight, I'm going to hover over the create button, it's not going to save unless you sign in. And, and after your project, if you wish to sign up, it will allow you to do that so you won't lose any work. But just so you're aware, um, there is no save, obviously, if you're not uh, a user of the service. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to click the Create button and it's going to bring me to the default splash page. So I'll just wait about 30 seconds and make sure everybody's caught up there. Sorry, I'm just testing the responsiveness here as I move my screen around. I just want to see it on my other device so I can get a sense of what the, the lag will be. Okay, great. So Scratch has a series of categories in the middle sort of panel right here. And underneath these categories, we have all the Lego code snippets. I call them Lego code snippets. So we're not actually writing code in the Scratch platform which is actually uh, a novel idea. Since I teach grades 7 and 8 and I'm not teaching computer science directly, if I want students to build a math application to demonstrate their learning, I don't want them to get frustrated focusing on syntax. I don't want them to care about where semicolons go and you know, spend an hour trying to, to debug a syntax error. So in the Scratch platform, uh, the code is built in. You link it together like Lego. You'll notice that each of these you know, block pieces is kind of a shape and they fit together like puzzle pieces and they're color coded. It's absolutely amazing uh, it's to provide a little bit of scaffolding, some differentiated instruction for our different learners. Under motion, you'll notice uh, a move block, some turning, uh, point in direction, 90, negative 90, point towards, you'll see an, uh, a go to XY. Just draw your attention to that. As I move my mouse cursor around the screen, You'll notice the um, coordinates right here. The, the Cartesian plane by default is happening. And so the cat by default, they plunk the cat at the origin of the screen. It's often a challenge to get my mess there, but you sort of get the idea. So immediately I'm sure you can see some of the geometry connections. Um, 
I would have students just, you know, quickly pop on and I would say, okay, you know, put the cat in quadrant two. And I would expect to see all of their screens look something like that, just to get a sense of if they understand uh, some of the principles of geometry. So it is a fantastic teaching tool, as well as a tool to demonstrate learning. As I scroll down, uh, you'll notice some, there's a glide command allowing the cat to move to a certain coordinate. You can change x by 10, that'll cause the cat to move to the right. If I put uh, a negative in there, it'll cause the cat to go backwards. So negative 10, and I hit the green, uh, I haven't even set it to do that, but that's what it'll do. I have to actually create the code snippets to show you what that looks like, and I'll do that in just one second. Change Y is the same, set Y to zero. Uh, if on edge bounce, you know, if you wanted to make a game of Pong or something, the ball will automatically bounce when it detects the side of the screen. All of those are underneath motion. So let's head over to looks. When I click on looks, you'll notice that they're a different shade of purple. Um, again, they link together using sort of Lego pieces, and there's a whole series of commands here to make the cat interact with you, the user. So you can have the cat speak, you can have the cat disappear, which is the hide. You can show the cat after he's been hidden if you wanted to make him disappear for some reason. You can change the costume of the cat, um, and I'll, I'll get to costumes in a second, and a variety of other sort of effects that you can apply to the costumes of the, the sprite. We call these sprites. You'll notice down here we have uh, a sort of sprite section. You know what I'm going to do? Something I should have done probably about 10 minutes ago. Let's just go on a little tangent here. How many of you have used Scratch before? I want to know if I can spend time going through this or if we can just jump right into it. So green check mark if this is your first time using Scratch. Sorry, yeah, green check mark if this is your first time on Scratch. Perfect, okay. I wondered, no hands were going up saying, you know, we get this. Okay, perfect. So let's keep, continue with this. So um, I can switch costumes. So if I want to create an animation, I actually have to code the animation. So if, if I wanted to make the cat appear as though the cat was moving, I would switch to costume two. I know that because up here in the costumes tab, I know that there's a second costume for the cat. And when I cycle between the two, it kind of gives the appearance that the cat is sort of walking. So Scratch allows me to do some really cool things, you know, make some stop motion, um, but it all has to be done by coding it instead of just actually recording the movie. So back to the scripts tab. Uh, we only have the three tabs here in the middle, scripts, costumes, and sounds. And we usually hang out under scripts, unless we're, like I said, trying to create some sort of animation stuff. OK, the sound category. Um, we can have the cat you know, play a sound. Students can record their own voice. Certainly a lot of fun if you're having students code a narrative story. They can include voices and include voices of their friends. There is a whole built-in library as well that I would like to show. So a lot of opportunity there to do some really cool things. Stop all sounds, you know, play, drum, increase volume, things like that. Anything you can think of that would be associated with sound, you'll find underneath the sound category. We're going to stay away from pen tonight. Um, pen is something that allows you to draw on the screen. If I wanted the cat to draw some geometric shapes, I could put pen down, uh, change the color, and then I could have the cat move in a certain direction and a line would follow him, just like an old Etch-a-Sketch. If you can think of an Etch-a-Sketch, you could actually code the cat to draw certain shapes like that. Really cool for geometry, you could have students, you could tell students, you know, um, have the cat draw an equilateral triangle, and that's actually quite challenging to do. You have to make the cat turn 120 degrees in order to create the 60 degree angle. So there's kind of an entry point there to teachable moments with exterior angles. We won't focus too much on it tonight, but uh, that is there in case you're interested in, in using it for geometry in that, in that way. Data, data is where you create variables. And so if I want to create a variable in the computer science world, a variable is sort of a placeholder that holds information. Um, think about your algebra strand of math, you know, you're solving for an unknown. That's what we use a variable for, it would store data. On the old Pac-Man game in the 80s, high score would have been stored in a variable so that the next user of the game could see what the previous, you know, the previous player's score was. That information would get stored in a variable. <clears throat> Variables are used, um, they're different from sort of a database where you store information forever. 
Variables are used to store information while an app is running, and the variables get cleared out as soon as you close the app. They're not stored in there forever. So if you unplug an original Pac-Man game, the high score is lost, and that poor unfortunate player has to go back and try and get it again. Up to events. Everything in computer science is event driven. Um, think about a web page. So let's pick on uh, let's pick on Facebook, and let's say you've hit your Facebook um, site in a web browser. Nothing happens until you do something. You can't post an update until you type and click. So these web technologies are always sitting and listening. Um, they're waiting for uh, events to occur before they can react. They sort of get to a place where they pause and they're waiting for you to give it that next instruction before it can do anything else. So we usually start with when green flag clicked in the Scratch platform. And the right side of the screen, this panel here, is where we're going to plunk all of our code together. So I'm going to put a when green flag clicked. And that just means whenever I click this green flag at the top, that's going to execute everything that's linked below when green flag clicked. So that's going to be our starting point. The stop button, of course, is to stop the code. If you get stuck in a loop or some crazy things are happening and you have no idea what's going on, hit the little stop sign there and it should be, should be good to go. I am ignoring the chat box, so if there's anything there, will somebody please just holler on me? Yeah, it's all good, I will it's all good Brian. In Thanks. My... I think people are intrigued. Okay, great. Okay. Uh, untitled, this is where you give it a name, so I'm going to say storytelling. Storytelling with Scratch, and that way when it's saved, uh, that's the name it's going to have. So let's begin. I can click and drag, and I can move this cat around. So I'm going to put him in the bottom left corner for now. And you'll notice that, um, oh, let me move my screen over a little bit. <clears throat> Top right corner, now we have the coordinates of the Scratch cat, so we know approximately where he is or she is on the screen at any given time. Because this is only an hour, uh, we're not going to have a lot of time to really create a story in detail, but we're at least going to create some dialogue, and we're going to store a user's name in a variable, and we're going to create some sort of interactivity with the cat. That's sort of my goal here, and we can extend it in any direction that we want. So when green flag clicked, let's have the cat say hello. So we're going to drag a hello out, and you'll notice that as I get close to the when green flag clicked, it highlights in white. That means they're linkable, they're clickable. Okay, so if I let go, it grabs like a magnet. So when green flag clicked, say hello for two seconds. When I hit, I always encourage students, you know, we used to say in the computer lab, save often, save often. And now, of course, we can, we write in the cloud with autosave and things like that. But and now I say test often, test often. You want to run your program all the time. So. It's easier to write fewer lines of code and to test it than to write hundreds of lines of code and to try and solve problems and errors then. So I'm going to hit the green flag, and the cat should say hello for two seconds. And he does, or she does. So that's fantastic. Um, I'm going to create, I'm going to code a little bit of a stop motion. I'm going to prompt the cat to ask me for my name. We're going to engage in a little bit of dialogue. And then I'm going to just basically have him walk off the screen. And if we have enough time, then we can create even more interactivity than that. So when green flag clicked, say hello. I'm going to go back over to motion because I want to move my cat. I want my cat to move 10 steps. You'll notice it turned white again. I can link them together. So I'm going to hit the green flag. He should say hello for two seconds and then move. Remember, this is a procedure. This is an algorithm. Just to clarify, he's only saying hello in text. Yes, Ellen, that's correct. He's only um, typing hello in a, in a speech bubble. So like a procedure, these are going to be run in sequential order. So move 10 steps is not going to happen until the hello is gone for two seconds. And you'll notice when I, when I click the flag that these code snippets will highlight so you know what's running at that point in time. So I'm going to go ahead and click this flag. He said hello, and he moved. If I do it again, hello, and he moved. You do it one more time, hello, and he moved. This is where I just want to highlight some of that computational thinking um, for a second. Because in my mind, I wanted the cat to start in the left-hand corner of the screen every time I click the green flag and to say hello and to move. 
Um, but I haven't actually told him to go anywhere. So if I, if I move the cat to this position and I click the green flag, he's going to say hello and he's going to move 10 steps, but exactly where he is. So I always encourage students to grab the go to command. It gives you more control over your code. And I'm going to put it back at the top. You can insert code in between existing lines. So I'm going to plunk it right there. And this is where you get to teach a little bit of geometry. I want my cat to start over here where my mouse cursor is. So I'm going to look for those x and y values. And my mouse cursor right now is at negative 197 and negative 70. So I'm going to put those coordinates in because I want my cat to start there every time I run the program. I forget what I said for y. We'll say negative 75. Negative 75. So, <laughs> excuse me. The cat now, obviously, is way up here in quadrant run, one, but when I click the green flag, <clears throat> he should go to negative 197, negative 75. Then he's going to say hello. Then he's going to move 10 steps in that order. So here we go. Green flag. And he moved. Again, I'm going to drag him up here. I'm going to click the green flag. He's going to go to that same coordinate I specified. He's going to say hello and then he's going to move. Now, let's say you wanted him to move a greater distance. The 10 steps kind of refers to the number line. Um, so he's only moving sort of 10 points on the x axis. So if I threw a 60 in there, it would be a bigger jump. So I'm going to move the cat back up here again. I'm going to click the green flag. He's going to go to that um, point on the Cartesian plane, say hello, and then he's going to do a big hop. So you'll notice that was significantly bigger than the 10 steps. I just wanted to show you that. But what I'm going to do now is I'm going to make this like three. I want to give the appearance of him walking. He's going to walk for a bit and kind of give us a little bit of interactivity. So I showed you under the costume tab, have him start in the same spot. Under scripts, I'm just going back. Lisa had a question. Uh, I added this go to command underneath the green flag. So every time I click the green flag, the cat is going to this coordinate point on this grid. Remember, we want to think of this white space as a Cartesian plane with the origin somewhere in the middle. Okay, so you can have the cat start at any coordinate you want. I just, without it, every time you click the green flag, the cat's going to continue to walk and eventually just walk off the screen and you're going to have to manually bring it back with the mouse. So I like to have more control over my animation so I know exactly how it'll run each time and anybody can run it. So uh, back to giving the appearance of him moving. We have a move three steps. I showed you that this costume, his legs change a little bit, his tail changes a little bit. So it gives the impression of him walking. So what you can do, you can have a move three step and then you can head, you can head over to looks and you can switch to costume two like so, which again is this costume uh, down underneath. By default, these are built in, costume one and costume two. So under scripts, move three steps, switch to costume two. And you might want to put another move three steps. And you might want to put a switch to costume one. And I'm going to give that a run. I have no idea what it's going to look like, but we're certainly going to try it out. You'll notice my cat is stuck on costume two right now. I don't like that. I wanted him to start on costume one. So I'm going to add that in now. I'm going to go back to my looks. I'm going to grab my switch to costume. And I'm going to put it back at the beginning because I want my cat to go to a certain coordinate point And I want him to be in costume one every time the program runs. Okay, it's very important to do that. So I'm going to bring him up here just to see if it works. I'm going to click the green flag. Hopefully, we get an appearance of him running. Didn't happen. It didn't happen because it actually runs through this code so fast. In you know machine language, it's hard for the human eye to pick up. That's OK. Under control, which I don't think we, we mentioned earlier, there's a wait command. So let's do move three steps switch to costume two, wait a half a second, 0 0.5, move three steps, and switch to costume one. 
And I'm going to try that again and see what it looks like. A little bit better. A little bit better. Let's say I wanted the cat to move um, across the screen a significant distance. I don't want to change the code that's already here because that was a pretty good looking animation. So we're going to use a loop. Uh, this is an entry point to teach students about looping in computer science. You know, as technology gets better and more efficient, it tends to get smaller. And the reason it gets smaller is we tend to recycle code and make code more efficient. And so instead of copying this code that I've just written about seven or eight times, and you can do that. If you right click on it, you have some commands like, like duplicate. You know, I could put that underneath to give the appearance of the cat moving across the screen. But that's inefficient because code actually takes up space in computer memory. So that's bad practice. We're not going to do that. We're actually going to use a repeat loop. And you'll know as you drag it around, it sort of gets bigger and stretches and wants to you know, enclose all of that code. So go ahead and do that. And then make sure you link it back together. Code will not run if it sits out by itself like this. It has to be linked. So I'm going to move the cat. I'm going to hit the green flag, and we're going to try again. A bit, a bit better, still not great. A bit better, still not great. But this is the process of learning that we really get to focus on with our students. And I find when I have kids working on something like this, it's a great point to grab some anecdotal about learning skills. You know, is, is little Johnny persevering? Is he wanting to shut down? Is he frustrated? Is he seeking experts? You know, how is this process of learning happening? Because this is a really open-ended task, and it actually is really challenging for a lot of students, anyone who's never been exposed to it, for that matter. So you can tinker with this. Um, maybe six steps looks better. Sorry, not three, but maybe six steps looks better. Let's try that again. <clears throat> Yeah, it looks a little bit better. Still not great, but students can play with those variables. And that's a great entry point to science. You know, they're altering variables to see a different outcome, which is something we do when we do our labs and our experiments in our science classroom. So I'm going to leave that alone for now. And I'm going to have the cat uh, ask me a question. So I'm going to have the cat, which is not under looks. Let me go through these last categories. I, I feel like I skipped them over. So control is where we get to do some looping. And control is where we get to do some, some if and some else, which allows our code to look and see if certain variables are set to true or false and things like that. Really powerful stuff. Um, I don't think we'll get to it tonight, but those uh, tools are certainly there. Sensing is, sensing gets used a lot, particularly if you're making games. You can have your sprites track to see if they touch each other or if they touch certain colors or how far they are away from each other. We're going to use ask. So I'm going to drag over the ask. Ask, what is your name, and wait. And I want to run the program. Remember, you want to try it as often as you can. So click the green flag, hello, he runs. And he's going to say, what is your name? I'm going to type in my name, it's Brian, and I'm going to push enter. And you'll notice that absolutely nothing happened. Nothing happened because we actually have to create a variable to store what I entered. So go over to data, and we're going to hit make a variable. And I'm going to name it name. Name is going to be the name of my variable. <clears throat> and I'm going to click the OK button. Now, you'll notice that now that I have a variable made and it shows up in the top left corner, I have some new commands that weren't there before. And I'm going to drag the set command underneath ask what is your name. And you'll notice it turns white and it links together. So set name to zero. That's not what we want. Go back over to sensing. You'll notice there's an answer right here. By default, whatever you type into that prompt gets stored an answer. And if I plunk it in that little white space, I'm going to store my name in the name variable. Let me run the program again. Cat moves back, says hello, runs across the screen. 
asks me my name, I'm going to type in Brian. Before I hit enter, keep an eye on the zero. Now my name is being stored in that variable. So my name is being stored in memory right now so that I can access it later on. Just going through the chat box. Is there a way to delete a step in the middle? Great question. This happens all the time. Let's say this wait point five seconds was problematic and I wanted to get it out of there. When you grab it, it wants to grab everything below it by default. So every time you grab a piece of code, everything underneath it will also be grabbed. So be very careful. You're going to want to pull out the code from the middle and then you're going to want to grab the code from underneath it and put that code back into the appropriate spot, like so. If you want to delete anything off the screen, like this wait command, you can right click on it and click delete, or you can just drag it back off of this window and it will go away. I'm going to plunk it right back in here though because I liked it. Okay, uh, next, so ask what is your name uh, and then I entered my name there. Very cool. I want the cat to reply to me now. So I went back over to looks and I'm going to pull out a say command. And I'm going to have the cat say, that is a nice name. But before I do that, I want the cat to actually, I want the cat to acknowledge my name. So I'm going to pull out another say command and put it in front of that one like that. And I'm going to head back over to data. And I'm going to plunk my name variable in there where it says hello, like so. And so now the cat should acknowledge your name and then tell you that you have a very nice name. So I'm going to run it. Cat moves back, says hello. We have a little bit of our animation. Mine's not switching costumes. I changed something by mistake. What's your name? I'm going to type my name. I'm going to press enter. And the cat will acknowledge my name and say that's a nice name. Brennan says, if you put another wait 0 0.5 seconds under switch to costume one, will that work? Let's try it under switch to costume one right here. <clears throat> Actually, that is a great idea because this is a, a repeat loop. The cat is switching costumes, moving, and then switching costumes again very, very quickly. So we're not getting that second animation. So let's see if that looks better. Hit the green flag. Hello. That's better. Thank you, Brendan. Still a little slow. You might want to change this to something like 0 0.2 or 0 0.2. What's your name? And I'm going to say it's John. John. That's a nice name. <clears throat> so you can see the interactivity here. And I'm sure there's a lot of ideas going through your head. Um, like I said, you know, uh, it, just at the bare bones of it, we're doing some geometry. There's a ton of number sense in here. Principles of algebra, I mean, we're talking about variables, lots of entry points to bring in science curriculum and talk about changing variables and looking at different outcomes. Um, <clears throat> you know, this, this whole thing is a process, so it's a, a great opportunity to sort of look at our learning skills, which are incredibly important, you know, the 60s, things like that, as we're going through this. I think I've been well over 15 minutes. Are there any questions at this time? A great question, Brennan. To my knowledge, there is not. Um, students can remix each other's code and alter code. It doesn't happen in real time on the same devices, unfortunately, but there is the ability to, you can create a program and, and students can sort of edit it and remix it amongst themselves, but not on the same document at the same time. How do we get another character? Great question. <coughs> Excuse me. Let's, let's look at some of the built-in functionality that's here. 
because there's a lot of really, really cool stuff. So, just going to drag my window ever so slightly there. Perfect. Underneath sprites, there's a series of options uh, beside new sprite. We can choose a sprite from a library. We can paint a new sprite. We can upload a sprite from a file. Or we can actually take a picture of ourselves and use that as a sprite. I'm going to use the sprite from the library just to show you what's already built in. Using the sprites in the library is great because a lot of times they come with multiple costumes. So creating the animations is, is seamless. If you're going to paint sprites, you have to keep in mind that you want to paint different costumes if you want them to appear to be animating. So let's have the cat interact with a beetle. I'm going to click on the beetle. There's a whole slew of categories on the left side, um, obviously targeted towards creating stories and creating games, stuff under fantasy, people, transportation, and different themes. We're actually going to change the backdrop, too. So I'm going to click on the beetle, and I'm going to click OK. What I want you to realize and what I want you to notice here is our scripts panel has gone blank. Don't get overwhelmed. Don't get alarmed. Don't let your students get alarmed. Back to our Pac-Man analogy. Each ghost in the game of Pac-Man behaves a little bit differently. So each sprite has its own code. We want the cat to ask us our name, but the beetle might do something else while the cat is doing that. So let's actually code the beetle to do something on its own. Remember, everything is event-driven, so this is not going to start until you hit the green flag. You can use some keyboard keys if you want to interact with your Scratch story that way. I've explored this with my students because we use the Makey Makey, which is a keyboard interface. And so we can interact with physical objects in the classroom to actually control things that are happening in our Scratch apps. But we'll save that for the next webinar. So when green flag clicked, go ahead and play. Let's have the beetle turn. Let's have him spin around, move 10 steps, turn, move 10 steps, and turn. And I just grabbed that arbitrarily. I have no idea what it's going to look like. Don't forget, though, you want your beetle to start at the same point every time. So I'm going to throw my go-to back at the top. And right now, he's in position 6385. And so I grab that by default. And I'm going to try that right now. My cat is moving a lot faster because I decreased my wait time. My beetle didn't really do a whole heck of a lot, but I know why. This is the trial and error part. I told him to turn 15 degrees clockwise, move 10 steps, and move 15 degrees counterclockwise. So he returned to his original orientation because I didn't put a weight in there. I'm actually going to get rid of this turn, and I'm going to keep the turns in the same direction and see what that does there. So I'm going to hit the green flag again. There we go. You notice the beetle turned 15 degrees twice, so it should have turned you know, 30 degrees in total. Every time I click the green flag, you'll notice that the beetle keeps spinning because I haven't told the beetle which way to point when he starts. I told it what coordinate to go to, but I didn't actually tell the beetle what direction to point in. So there's a point in direction 90 here, and you can change the angles to whatever you want. I know there's only four built in, but you can actually type in there. So if I want to type 45, my beetle will always be in that same orientation when I click the green flag. There it goes. And I keep clicking the flag, and you'll notice that nothing is happening because I haven't actually put in any, any weights in here. So play around with that. I'm going to give you three minutes to play, if that's all right with you. My voice is getting rapid. OK, so our backdrop is rather boring. Um, if you click on stage one backdrop to the left of the cat, you'll notice at the top in the middle, it switched from costumes to backdrops. And so now we're going to put in a few different backdrops. Again, we get the same options as we do with our sprites. You can paint your own, or you can import one from anywhere. Um, if you grab one off the internet, go ahead and do that. That's fine. I'm going to use built-in library again. 
And I'm going to use, I don't know, how about blue sky? And I'm going to click OK. And now that is my, my default backdrop. And actually, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to delete this first one by clicking that little X to the top right of that backdrop. OK. So I'm going to actually add a second backdrop now, because we want to make our story you know, progress through different settings, things like that. So I'm going to open a second backdrop. And I'm going to just pick on uh, brick wall for now and click OK. And you notice it wants to do that by default. So I'm going to have blue sky clicked. I'm going to go back to my cat for a second, and I'm going to hit scripts. Every time I click the green flag, I want to make sure I get my blue sky backdrop and not the bricks. So it's very important now to go back to looks and to find there's a switch backdrop to brick wall. And I'm going to put that right back at the very beginning again. We're sort of trying to create all the default settings every time you run the story. Otherwise, all the variables and settings will remain as they were left off every time you click the green flag. So plunk that in there and hit on blue sky. And just to show you it, I'm going to switch backdrops to, to brick wall. And when I click the green flag, of course, I'm going to move my cat. I'm going to move my beetle just to make sure everything's working. When I click the green flag, I should get my blue sky backdrop. I should get the beetle moving back up here. And I should get the cat going back to the bottom left corner and ask me what my name is. So fingers crossed, here we go. Perfect. It worked exactly as I wanted it to. Of course, it looks like my cat is walking in air, and that's no good. So I'm going to go back to scripts. Uh, this isn't the script I want, and that's because I'm on the beetle sprite. Make sure you click on your cat. And I'm going to play around here. I'm going to do some testing on my x, y coordinates. The cat was too high. I didn't like how high he was. I'm just going to type something in here, test, to get rid of this prompt. Now we get to sort of estimate. So I put my mouse cursor there. You'll notice the y value is negative 126. If I put my mouse cursor down here, my y value is approximately negative 168. So I'm going to go ahead and change this one here to negative 168. I'm going to see what happens. Way too far down. And there's a reason for that. Um, each costume <coughs> it has a certain orientation on its own. And so the cat orientated to its costume might be a little bit too low so that when you actually set the coordinate to it, um, it's, it's not in the uh, appropriate spot. So I'm going to head back over to uh, sorry, scripts, and I'm going to move them up a bit. Again, we're teaching geometry, so negative 168 is too low. Let's try negative 120. I'm going to click the green flag. Actually, that looks pretty good right there. The beetle in the sky is kind of goofy, but we can play with that later on. So what's your name, Brian? Brian. That's a nice name. Let's continue our story now. <clears throat> so underneath the say that's a nice name, I'm going to actually have the cat say something else, like, are you ready for this adventure? Question mark. And I'm going to create a variable under data. What I'm having now is you can actually code some choose your own adventures. So let's say the cat says, are you ready for this adventure? You, as the user, will either say yes or no. And if you say no, nothing will happen. If you say yes, we're going to actually change the backdrop to bricks. So I'm going to make a variable, and I'm going to call it, um, this is tough. It's very important to teach students about naming conventions. So I want the, var the name of this variable to represent what its job is. So are you ready for this adventure? I guess I will call it adventure. And then we'll say, you know, adventure is true or adventure is false, or adventure is yes, or adventure is no. So are you ready for this adventure for two seconds? And then I'm going to grab an ask again. 
this is a, a big learning curve for students is looks makes every character talk. But sensing is the one you want to use if you're prompting for something. It's a little bit goofy, but that's just the way it's, I guess it makes sense to be under sensing that you're asking for something and then waiting. So we're going to ask. It doesn't always have to be a question. I mean, I asked the question in the line above, are you ready for this adventure? I'm going to put type yes or no in quotation marks like that to sort of tell the user um, yes or no, and that that's what we want them to type, OK? Again, don't forget, we have to actually set adventure to answer. Otherwise, it won't store it. I'm going to try it. Hello. Walk, walk, walk. What is your name? Our beetle moved a little bit. My name is Brian. Brian, that's a nice name. Are you ready for this adventure? Type yes or no. I'm going to type yes. And I'm going to hit enter. You'll notice that our adventure variable is now set to yes, but nothing happened. This is where we get to play with some of our Boolean logic. Uh, I'm kind of filling the screen here. You can hit a magnifier uh, to shrink it. It might be hard for you to see on the webinar on my screen, but that option is there when you start to, to fill in. There's no scroll bar until, of course, I actually go right off the screen. So I'm going to leave it like that so far. I'm going to go over to control because we're going to actually do some math. I'm going to pull out the if then. And you'll notice this um, hexagon shape here. Hexagon, six sides. Hexagon shape in the middle. Only certain pieces will fit in there. And it's fun to watch kids try and do this. No, that doesn't work. That doesn't fit. You know, uh, grab, grab things that are not the same shape at all. That doesn't fit. But it'll fit inside. It just won't fit in the little hexagon there. So go over to operators. We haven't talked about operators at all. Here are mathematical operators. Plus, minus, multiplication, division, random numbers, uh, less than, equals, greater than, and or not, join, letter, Mod is a great one. Mod returns the remainder when you divide. There's a round function. So if you put, you know, round 5.6, it'll return 6. Or if you put round 5.2, it'll return 5. And there's a square root function. So what we're going to do is we're going to use an equals. And I want you to head back over to data. And I want you to grab name. I'm going to plunk a name. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Not name. Adventure. Plunk adventure in there. If adventure equals yes. Because remember, that's what we told the user to type. Type yes or no. And now that you've got this code snippet built, grab it by the equal sign and place it inside the if. So it looks like that. And just sort of run through this in your mind for a second. If adventure equals yes, then. So what this means is none of the code inside here will execute if the user types anything other than yes. They could type yes with two s's and nothing will run. It has to be the word yes, y-e-s. Otherwise, absolutely nothing will happen. So we're a little bit misleading right here where we said type yes or no. They could actually type yes or anything but yes, and it won't actually run. But that's OK. We can go back in and, and account for that later on. So plunk that underneath. If you are ready for this adventure, I'm going to go back to looks, let's change to a brick wall. And I'm going to put that inside the if. Nothing should happen if I type anything other than yes. <laughs> this is a great opportunity to have kids test, though. You want to run this twice now. You want to type in something other than yes, and you want to type in yes to actually see what's going to happen. I'm going to move my cat. I'm going to move my beetle just to key bug a little bit and make sure everything's working as it should. I'm going to click the green flag. Hello. Walk, walk, walk. What is your name? Steve. Enter. Steve, that's a nice name. Are you ready for this adventure? So if I type no, nothing should happen. If I type anything other than yes, nothing should happen. But I'm going to type no, and that's the end of my program. OK, run it again. What is your name? My name is Brian again. Enter. Enter. 
This time I'm going to type yes. Cross your fingers. As soon as I push enter, we should see a brick wall. And we do. So fantastic. It's working. So we sort of, you know, you've almost coded, uh, we're getting ready for chapter two or something like that in your story. So lots of opportunity for kids to sort of chunk their ideas, I guess, in their narrative writing uh, and sort of break them into different segments. I thought I heard a question. I did hear a beep. I see yeah, a question in the chat box. Are there a couple box. questions, Can I... Okay. Uh, can we have more than one speech bubble at a time? You absolutely can, uh, just not by the same character. So we can go back to our beetle, and we can have our beetle say something at the same time as the cat. And hit the green flag. And they both went away. But you certainly can. Different sprites can, have, can be interacting uh, at the same time. And we have a, go ahead, somebody's mic is on. Okay, the next question I see, can a sprite be added or removed during the program or must they be visible the entire time? That's a great question. Let's say our animated beetle was just sort of a backdrop animation and the beetle will not exist on the brick wall. We're going to do something that's pretty powerful, pretty cool now. So the question was, can we have sprites go away and come back throughout? And we absolutely can. And we're going to use something under the, uh, my mind is drawing a blank, events. We're going to use something under events. We're going to use something called broadcast. And what broadcast does is it allows the, the code and all the sprites to sort of run simultaneously, but then wait until something is broadcasted. So picture like a broadcast, you know, a news broadcast or a radio broadcast. Something will happen if something has been broadcasted. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to pull a broadcast out. And I'm going to switch from message. When I click the down arrow, it says message one or new message. I'm going to click new message, and this message name is going to be scene two. That's just what I'm calling it. This is going to refer to when I switch to the brick wall, I want the beetle to disappear. I'm going to click OK, and I'm going to put that broadcast inside this if, right there. Okay? So if the user types, yes, I'm ready for this adventure, I want... The cat will broadcast scene two. We're not going to see anything. It's happening in the background. And then I want it to switch to the brick wall. Now, head over to the beetle code. Okay, click on the beetle. And still under events, you will see when I receive, like so. And you'll notice it doesn't link on anything. else. It's meant to be a standalone because it's, it's like, again, it's like an event, so it's waiting. This code underneath when I receive, I'm sorry on my iPad, it's a little bit laggy there. The code underneath when I receive will not run until it's broadcasted from the cat. So now we're sharing back and forth um, because the, 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 the length it takes for a user to enter their name, that's a, a changing variable. So you can't account for that. You can't say you have 10 seconds to enter your name. So it sort of waits until the cat broadcasts and says, yep, you know, we're ready for scene two. And then the beetle, when I receive scene two, go back over to looks, and you're going to drag a hide. So what happens now is if you type yes when the cat asks you if you're ready for an adventure, the cat will broadcast scene two, the beetle will receive scene two, and the beetle will be instructed to hide. Okay? Now, what's important, you've now hidden the beetle. The beetle will always be hidden forever until you code it to show. So it's very important now to grab a show and put it underneath when green flag clicked so that the beetle will appear every time you restart your story. Otherwise, it's now hidden forever, and you'll wonder where it went, and that's why. So I'm going to click the green flag, try it again. 
Walk, walk, walk. What is your name? My name is Brian. Enter. Brian, that's a nice name. Well, thank you. Are you ready for this adventure? Absolutely. When I push enter, we should get a brick wall, and we should have a beetle disappear. Perfect. Done. Gone. Now, because we've done that, uh, because we're now broadcasting stuff from the cat, broadcast scene two, we can actually pull out a broadcast for the cat. And so now that we're on scene two, maybe I want the cat to go way back up here and sort of be off the screen as if the cat's walking on the sidewalk. So when I receive scene two, I'm going to use another go to, and I'm going to tell the cat to go to this approximate coordinate, negative 204 and 45. <clears throat> What's pretty cool about Scratch now, I want to I want to copy that algorithm we created that shows him walking. So if I right click on the repeat, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to move this ask off just a little bit like that. I'm going to right click on repeat. I'm going to click duplicate. And I'm going to plunk it right underneath. So my animation of the cat walking, I can reuse that. Now make sure you put this back on. Make sure you link the ask back together. This is where it gets a little bit time consuming. I know we're down to the last 20 or so minutes. I want to run it every single time. Um, and the more code you write, of course, the longer it's going to take to trial it. What's your name? My name is Brian. Are you ready for this adventure? Type yes or no. I'm going to type yes. Enter. The cat moved up. He's on the sidewalk and he's walking. And so you can recycle all the code uh, that you've already written there. I just want to play with operators just for a couple of minutes. I want to take some questions. I know that this is fast and incredibly overwhelming, but great way to be super cross-curricular now. I want to have my cat ask me math questions. I've used geometry. I've used principles of algebra. I've certainly used number sense in order to create this little animation. But now I actually want the cat to ask me some questions. So let's say now when I receive scene two, our cat just walked, and now he's right here on the sidewalk. He's going to say, hey, I have a uh, you know, puzzle for you. I'm going to drag another say. Are you up for the challenge? Question mark. Basically, what I want the cat to do is, because I just finished surface area and volume today in grade seven, I'm just going to have the cat ask me to type in, um, all right, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to offer the dimensions of a cube, and I want the user to tell me the volume. And the cat will determine if you're right or wrong. If you're right, you can proceed in the story. If you're wrong, maybe this scene will start over and ask me the question again. It's really cool. You'll notice that kids will learn the formulas and the math as a byproduct of this process because they want to get it done. And they want their kids, they want their friends to play it, and they want their parents to play it. So they sort of learn... I've noticed that they, they will learn the formulas as a byproduct in this process because you want them to test their data too. So if, if they create an application that tells me the dimensions of a cube and I enter an appropriate volume and it, something is wrong, you know, they might have a math error somewhere, but they will be determined to correct that. It sort of brings a little bit of authenticity to some of the math that, um, that we're doing. So that's just what I'm going to do right now. So hey, are you up for a puzzle? Sorry, I have a puzzle for you. Are you up for the challenge? And I'm going to use an ask. What is the volume of a 3 by 3 by 3 cube? Question mark. Okay. Now, I have to make another variable to store the answer. So I'm going to make a variable, and I'm going to call it volume. And I'm going to click on OK. And of course, I'm going to drag the volume out. You see how it's getting really messy now. 
We're, we're limited in the space that we have, but that's okay. It's okay to put code over top of each other as long as you can sort of see it, but it can get messy. So I'm going to do a set volume to answer. And for the sake of time, I'm going to have the cat tell me I'm right or wrong. I'm not going to have the scene restart or anything like that. I'm just going to say, the cat's going to tell me whether I'm right or I'm wrong. But now, as a grade 7 student, I have to know that the volume of this cube is 27 cubic units, because it's 3 by 3 by 3, and the formula is length times width by height. I have to know that as the programmer, as the coder. So I'm going to pull out my equal sign again. I'm going to head back over to control, and I'm going to use my if hexagon then, and we're going to build the hexagon before we plunk it in. Head back over to data, if volume equals 27, plunk that in there, link that back underneath, notice it's white and it links, it's magnetic, then the cat is going to tell me how awesome I am. Correct. Make sure you spell it right, Aspinall. Correct. Okay. But I want the cat to tell me I'm also, you know, perhaps not wrong. Actually, it's going to be quite easy to to redo this scene, I think. So let's let's try this. I'm going to try something I haven't done in a while. So um, I actually grabbed the wrong F. Okay, so there was an if hexagon then. There's also an if hexagon then else. That's the one I want. I can move this back and plunk it in that one. And I can move the, the purple one down as well. I'm going to get rid of this if by dragging it off the screen so that it disappears. Careful not to let it go inside somewhere else. Like that. And I'm going to link this back on. And the reason I want to use if else, if this returns false, and this is Boolean logic. If volume is 27, this returns true, and the code inside here gets executed. If this returns false, in other words, I enter 37, 37 is not equal to 27, this will not execute. The else command will execute. So now I can have the cat say, sorry, that is not correct, period. What I'm thinking, and I haven't tried this ahead of time, I want the cat to tell me I'm wrong, and then I'm thinking that if I rebroadcast scene two, it should start everything over again. Don't quote me on that, just a hunch. I'm going to try it. Back to the beginning, hello. Hello, Beetle. What is your name? Steve. That's a nice name. Are you ready for this adventure? You betcha. Yes. Brick wall. Here we go. Challenging math part. Now, I've, of course, I have, to t I have to test it twice, right? Hey, I have a puzzle for you. Are you up for the challenge? What is the volume of a 3 by 3 by 3 cube? Um, let's try and get it right. 27. 3 times 3 is 9. 9 times 3 is 20. 27. It is late here on a Monday night. Enter. Correct. So that worked. It executed the correct command. And now it's just going to sit here. I haven't coded anything else. Uh, it said correct. And we're sort of at the end of the code. There's nothing more. That's fine. I'm going to run through it again. This time I'm going to enter a wrong number. And hopefully, hopefully it rebroadcasts that scene. Uh, the brick wall starts again. The cat moves back and asks me again. What's your name? Brian. Uh, yes, of course I am. Cat's walking down the sidewalk. Hey, I have a puzzle for you. Are you up for the challenge? Oh, I'm going to say 21. I'm going to push enter. Cross your fingers. If my thinking is correct and my code is right, he's going to tell me I'm wrong, rebroadcast scene 2, which is going to make when I receive scene 2 launch again, which should send the cat back to the left side of the screen, have him walk, and prompt me with the math question again. Hopefully. Enter. Sorry, that's not correct. And he did. So there you go. Rebroadcasted scene two. So now I'm stuck in this loop. Um, I cannot proceed our story until I actually enter the correct 
um, mathematical number. It could be anything. It doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to be math. It could be. Um, it could be science content. The cat could ask me any sort of a question. Students could create, you know, narrative story quizzes that are about the War of 1812 or history curriculum or anything of that nature. Really depends on their imagination and, you know, the amount of time that they have to sort of tinker with it. In my experience, this process has been so successful. Now, coding is obviously not for everyone. I do wish it to be exposed to everyone. You don't know if you hate broccoli until you try broccoli. There are students in my class that, you know, coding wasn't for them, and I don't push it. But there are students in my class that absolutely love it, and they wouldn't have known about it had they not had the opportunity. And the ones that do are, are going home and just playing on Scratch for hours and hours and hours. And I've been teaching, I've been using Scratch as a tool for the better part of a decade now. And what I'm finding, our school board has sort of a framework we follow in math. And unfortunately, we, we kind of teach strands in isolation. Um, we don't tend to follow the textbook, I guess, as much as we, we once did. But if we were to teach geometry, which you know we do where I'm from, geometry in term two tends to be in the spring. And if you've been playing on Scratch since September, the idea of <laughs> translating, flipping, turning, rotating you know, a sprite across the Cartesian plane in the spring towards the end of the school year it's uh, it's rather it's rather interesting to hear the conversation. I used to struggle teaching algebra. You know, students would say, "What do you mean? There's letters in math? This is craziness!" And, and now through this process, it's not such a foreign concept when they understand the idea of those letters are just placeholders and they have to sort of solve for the unknown. You know, sort of patterning in algebra if you're solving for solving for n, let's say. Um, if you've been even just using Scratch in your language classes, those concepts in math seem to be significantly more fundamental and easier to explore. There's a student in my class right now who's creating the Flappy Bird game that, you know, went viral two years ago and then went away just as fast. And he really didn't grasp the concept of the Cartesian plane until he started this Flappy Bird thing because he wants when you hammer on the space key, he wants the bird to go up, and when you let go of the space key, he had to code gravity. So when you let go of the space key, the bird had to go down by itself. And um, he really understood now. He, he sort of immersed himself. Seymour Papert calls that math land. When you surround students with numbers and you make it authentic and you make it's almost tangible and they get to explore and tinker with it, that's really when they you know, construct their own learning. He he's very fond of the constructivist approach, and I have been too, actually, in the in the last decade, just through this process. And you know, for me, Scratch started as an after-school coding club, and then it became a lunchtime coding club. And then, as I began to learn my curriculum more and more, you know, as my experience grew, I began sort of having teachable moments at lunchtime about entry points to to our curriculum, and that's when I really realized that. There's a lot of potential here to do some really cool things across all of our curriculum areas, with geometry sort of being that, you know, fundamental principle. Like you need the understanding of the geometry to make this happen, and then what you do with it after that, phenomenal. So, I call using Scratch to teach math the spiraled approach to mathematics instead of teaching strands in isolation. It's very spiraled. Um, Obviously, incredibly problematic in terms of evaluation. It's very easy to assess this work. It's very easy to give kids next steps and encourage them to move in their learning. A um, little bit more challenging as a teacher to sort of recognize conversations as pieces of evaluation when kids are demonstrating learning from a whole variety of strands of math in the same 60 minute block. However, anecdotal, the importance of observation and conversation too, which growing success says we can vary for each kid based on our own professional development. So we're down to about 11 minutes on my clock. If there are any questions about Scratch, any questions about resources, I'm just going to open the floor. Anybody has anything they'd like to share, I am all ears. Going through the question, sign in and save, can others see it? Or is it private? And Jason's already answered that. I'm going to do that right now. 
I'm going to click sign in. Of course, you're all watching now, and I can't remember my password because it's saved by default in the other browser. Ha, ah, got it. No, don't save. Okay. What I do love about Scratch now, uh, if you click see project page in the top right corner, this is what other people will see if you have shared it. And you'll notice there's a big sort of yellowish banner at the top and a big share button. And it says, this project is not shared. Click share. So had I copied this link and emailed it to you right now, you would not be able to see my animation until I click this share button. So clicking the button makes that banner go green. It says your project is now shared. If I already email you this link, you would see exactly what we built today. I can add some instructions. I can add some notes and credits. I can scroll down a bit. This is my absolute favorite. I embed my students' work on our website all the time. So here's the embed code. If you have a class website or an LMS or something like that, <clears throat> you can have students share the project page with you. That's this link at the top. You can go on. You can grab the embed code. And you can plunk it onto a website, sort of have a gallery of work, a body of work. And, you know, it, it can remain nameless. Students don't have to enter notes and credits or, you know, add to the instructions there. So great way to share work with your parent community, grandparent community, and other people in your building, too. You mentioned a lunchtime club, love it, but how would one with very little experience initiate and carry out a scratch or coding club? <clears throat> how young would you recommend the students be as young as grade one? That's a great, great question. So <clears throat> Scratch, the developers of Scratch say it's for, I want to say it's eight-year-olds to 15, somewhere in that ballpark. What bothers me about that is we blanket kids by age and, and not ability. I've seen seven-year-olds who are really good at coding, and I've seen 12-year-olds who can't stand it. So I, I guess that's a good benchmark, um, sort of grade three, grade four. I'm going to turn off my screen sharing now so that we can go back to the, <clears throat> sorry, to the whiteboard. So application sharing, stop. Just because I want to type on my computer, Jennifer beat me to it. I was going to hit Scratch Junior. Scratch Junior is an iPad app that has all the same categories as the Scratch you just saw. The blocks of code are limited. Instead of move 10 steps, you'll have a right arrow. And instead of move negative 10 steps, you'll have uh, a, a, a left arrow. Sorry. So. There are other ones. Um, if you are an Apple, if the iPad land has invaded your school board like it has for a lot of us, Hopscotch is a great place. Tinker is a great place. Scratch Junior is a great place. Pionki is a great place. Those are all apps on the iPad. Um, one I should share is called Snap. So Scratch is by MIT. And Berkeley took Scratch, which is Flash-based, and ported it to HTML5. I'm just going to grab the link now. It doesn't have a community like Scratch does. There's not a lot where you can sort of go on and remix other people's codes. And the sharing is very limited, but it is exactly Scratch and not Flash-based. And so it does work in the browser on <clears throat> iOS on any browser. So here's, here is snap, snap.berkeley.edu. So like I said, Berkeley ported the Flash version to an HTML5 version. It's not as fluid. It's not as nice. But it certainly works. And yes, Tinker, Hopscotch, Pionki, Scratch Jr. are all wonderful if you have iPads. So I encourage you to check out my YouTube channel. I've recorded some tutorials. Um, if you wanted to use Scratch just for math, I'll give you a game changer example for me, teaching probability in the intermediate grades. Traditionally for me was giving kids change and having them flip, flip coins and recording into a tally chart how many heads and tails they got. And it was sort of, sort of a gong show with volume and you know change flying all over the room. And, 
I had one student one year say, I could code this. There's a random function in Scratch. And he actually coded a coin flipper. And I can run his program a million times really, really, really fast and actually teach kids that the more times you run the simulator, the theoretical probability and the experimental probability get very, very, very close. And that's something I wasn't able to do before. I just sort of had to explain that that's what happened. We could flip the coin 100 times in class, but it would lose its validity, as I'm sure you're aware. That wouldn't last more than about 20 minutes in class. So I've recorded some videos like that. Um, coding the particle theory in science has been a game changer for me. As a science teacher, I've always taught solid, liquid, and gas, and the particle theory and you know, the behavior of particles as you add heat, they speed up and spread apart. Students have to infer those animations from a textbook with squiggly lines and arrows. And I was about three years into my teaching career, and I had one student say, those lines mean movement? And it was just this jaw-dropping moment. I thought I'd been butchering science for three years. I just assumed these kids would all realize that meant movement, and they didn't. So. You could have students code the particle theory. And remember, they have to use geometry to do that. They have to move particles across the screen. And if they're gas particles, they have to sort of move randomly and in all directions across the screen. And that involves changing some x and y values. So some really, really great entry points to lessons we already have, you know, existing lessons. I don't want scratch and coding to be an add-on, but more of a supplement in order to not necessarily do things better, but certainly do things different and uh, be very cross-curricular. If you take the time and the energy, you'll find that one good Scratch project might be something that you could work on all day long, and you could hit four or five different classes if, uh, if you teach a homeroom easily. And uh, it might be a really, really neat way to do some really cool collaborative, collaborative inquiry stuff. David Carruthers did that with my class last year. Awesome. On that note, if there are no more questions, I'm going to pause my microphone and take a big glass of water. That was awesome, Brian. I loved that. And it was great that you could see um, it's the program being built from scratch, literally, and um, how it goes step by step in so many cross-curricular um, connections. I just think it's wonderful, and I hope that everybody has an opportunity to give that a try. So thanks so much for your wisdom and all of your resources. And I posted the link to your YouTube channel so that people can take a look at that. So thanks for everybody for coming tonight. And um, just in closing, at, when you um, log out of the session, just by going up to the top and logging out, either by pressing the red button or going to the exiting completely out of the program, it's going to take you to a survey that um, is very valuable information for us if you could be filling that out for a couple of reasons. One of them is when you finish, um, when you do the survey, you'll be sent um, a certificate of that you've participated in this webinar, and several people would like that for their personal portfolios and professional portfolios. And also it gives um, OTF an indication of, of what people would like to see and uh, feedback on a particular session, and then share that information with the Ministry of Education so that they continue funding the OTF Connects program. Um, that's been really valuable professional development for teachers. So I'll also put that link in the chat if it doesn't come up. It should come up um, automatically tonight when you log out of the session. And then there are some upcoming sessions and other great upcoming sessions in the next um, till the end of the month, so that they're listed here. And they are also available at, on the OTF Connects site. And if you um, would like to hear some recordings and see other um, webinars, Brian's webinars are actually archived on the OTF Connects um, site as, as, as well. So the, the link is there. So thank you very much. Um, Brian, for all of your work and for everybody for participa participating in tonight's webinar. So we hope to see you again soon. And I'm just going to stop the recording. So thank you very much.